I get like several emails. Um, Dave Thermalai told me he's driving. Like favorite excuse of people. Or right, no, right. And then uh, Henri Orlan told me he's driving from the mountains. Right. Which I guess is good. You know, people are enjoying the mountains. Yeah, but then they're missing out on great talks, right? That's a disadvantage. So you're just great coming talks. back from the mountains. I'm sorry? You you just you just come back, you just came back from the mountains. Which great yes, talks me too. I, I I just drove from the mountains as well. Yeah. You were you were climbing or just hiking? Uh climbing a little bit. Which mountains are these? Uh, in uh, Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Very nice. I'm missing the mountains here in Denmark, but they have a very nice sea instead, which is also good. That's that's also good. So you you're in Denmark now. Yes. How long are you going to be there? Well, the original plan was to be there all of August and September, but due to the circumstances, I had to delay things a little bit. So I'm I've been here for about a week now. But you're going to be there uh, through September. Yeah, but I'll go back and forth a little bit. So mm. most of the time I'll be here. Hi, Thomas. Good morning. Good afternoon, Ben. How are you? Oh. Hi, Vito. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon, yes. I see Peter Hans here. Hi, Peter. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Hi. Oh. Hi, Peter. Hi. Hello. Oh, Alessandro is also there. Hello, hello. Hi, Ali. Hi, Dima. Hello. Hello. Hagen, hello. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> I just submitted the form for your talk. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Let's hope it works out in February. Right. Hi, Peter. Bill is here as well, I see. Hi, Bill. You hear us? Hi, Walter. Hi. So even though it's six, let's let's wait another two minutes. <clears throat> There is a number, there are a number of latecomers. Oh, hi, Bill. Adima, Dave is driving back to Texas. Yes, yes, everybody's driving. Henri is driving from the mountains back to Paris. So they all send me email saying that, sorry, we cannot be at your talk because we're driving. Yeah. So I guess that's everybody's excuse. Bill, what do you have on your head? What is that? What? I don't have anything on my hand. No, Bill has a hat. Oh, Bill. Yeah. That's, that's a settlement school of music hat. Ah, okay. That's my daughter's music school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Very good. Cool. Probably recognize that symbol. No, but it's a nice symbol.
Hello, Ron. How you doing, man? Hello, Where's Ron. I, I can't see you for some reason, but I can hear you. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, I see. We Wait, see you. are you... Are you in your office? No, no. I'm... Oh, okay. For some, uh, somehow I thought, no, okay. Yeah, I'm going to come to work on it tomorrow. So today I'm still at home. Wait, so your class, are you teaching it uh, in person, all in person? I'm very confused about this. Actually, I'm not completely <laughs> decided. So I'm, I'm doing double path. I'm, rec I'm recording all my lectures. And I post them. I post already two of them. Okay. But I will come to the lectures uh, seminar room and I'll see how many people will come and probably have some good chat. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, I think that our administration is a little bit confused and undecided at this point. Yeah, I think we... it's uh, everybody, everybody is very confused right now. So we'll see. Peter. Uh, you're in your office, though. I, I see I'm in the... my office, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the office is fine, and uh, I think I'll, I'll, I have even office hour on Wednesday, which I'm going to, uh, to use, but uh, my, the lecture room that I'm assigned is supposed to hold about 45 people, and the numbers of students in my class is 42 people. Oh, so, you so know, it, as far as density is concerned, it's very unsafe, so. Yeah. I don't know. I just returning from California, so I, we deposit our child in uh, Berkeley. Oh, great! He's, he's, he's doing math, so he's a more serious guy than I am. So then, uh, but they have a very very strict rule: you have to be tested and vaccinated and always wear a mask. And people even in the street, they are you can't see anybody without a mask, which is sort of quite different from us. Yeah, I think here it's kind of a, I think about half of the people moved on uh, and the other half is double masking. And depends on if you go to Whole Foods, everybody's wearing a mask. If you go to HEB, people don't wear masks. So it just depends on. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a crazy uh, time. Yeah. Anyway. All right, okay, so maybe so I think the, the, the numbers have stabilized roughly. Um, and uh, we're just five past six. So I think it's, it's time to start. So first of all, it's great to see so many of you again to uh, joining our webinar on protein folding and dynamics. Uh, despite the summer vacation season, we just heard that uh, a number of people are currently driving either probably to vacation, most likely back from vacation. Uh, anyway, they're going to have the chance to, to listen to your talk, Dima, uh, via YouTube afterwards, and I'm pretty sure they're going to take this chance. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Dima Marker today as our speaker uh, from the University uh, of Texas at Austin. And as you might have seen from his uh, title, Dima is a theoretical physicist. And luckily for us, he decided that proteins are not only biologically important, but they are also surprisingly interesting. Um, but Dima actually started his career not on proteins, but um, as a theoretical physicist uh, in quantum physics and reaction rate theory, and also continued this line of research during his postdoc, uh, working on density functional theory and reaction rate theory, together with the famous Walter Cohen and also Horia uh, Metsu at UCSB. Uh, but already at this time at Santa Barbara, and probably due to his friend Kevin Plaxko, uh, Dima became interested in proteins and, for example, derived uh, from first principles uh, the correlation between contact order and uh, protein folding rates. And since then, Dima's work has been extremely influential, particularly for every experimentalist working in the field of single molecule spectroscopy. And one of the great aspects of Dima and his work and his personality is that he's really proactive, engaging with experimentalists in order to actually extract the most information out of uh, a single molecule experiments. And so his recent work ranges from understanding internal friction in disordered proteins and unfolded proteins over deriving suitable tests for macabianity in single molecule experiments up to exploring the possibilities of extracting energy landscape information from transition past times and transition past time 
distributions. And I'm sure that we will hear about this work in detail uh, in just a few minutes. A few words about Dima CD. Dima received his PhD in theoretical physics from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and then became a postdoc, as I already mentioned, at uh, UCSB. And since 2001, he uh, uh, leads his own research group uh, at the University uh, of Texas at Austin. Now, given all the seminal contributions, Dima, of course, received many awards. I just mentioned two of them, the NSF Career Award and the Montreal Challenge Award, but there were many more uh, to mention. And today, Dima will tell us on, uh, about how he studies protein folding and dynamics by proving theorems. And uh, we're all looking forward to that, Dima. But before I can hand over the virtual stage to you, I, we have just a few formal things uh, uh, that should be mentioned. First of all, please, everybody mute yourself such that we can uh, listen to Dima. As always, uh, uh, the talk will be followed by a Q&A session of about 10, 15 minutes. If you encounter a question during the talk, please use the chat window, type in question, and I will call you name by name um, after, the, uh, after the talk. And uh, one important announcement, uh, during September, we are not gonna have a webinar. We will have a long break uh, to accommodate the uh, Jewish holidays. Uh, and so our next speaker in this webinar is gonna be Peter Wright on Monday, October the 4th. And so with this, um, Dima, thanks a lot for joining us today. And we are really looking forward to your talk. I stop sharing my screen and uh, please stage is yours. Okay, let's see if it still works. Can you see it? Yeah, looks very good. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, I know that the format, given the format of this talk, it's not easy sort of to ask questions in the middle of the talk, but uh, generally I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I have nothing to sell to you. I, I kind of, given how many smart people are in, in this virtual room, I, I kind of want to discuss some of the open problems, which I think are open problems. And I would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what I think they are. So first of all, let me acknowledge people uh, who worked on this. So um, most of the work I'm gonna talk about were done by uh, a very smart graduate student, Rohit Satija, who's now at uh, working with uh, Carlos Bustamante at Berkeley. Uh, and by Sasha Berishkovsky at NIH, who you, many of you know. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work, a collaboration with Ben Schuler's group and with Daniel Fleur and, and Niels in particular, about using these ideas and application to single molecule experiments. Now, so the problem I want to discuss is, is really a very simple one. So uh, in the last decade, um, people doing single molecule experiments um, learn how to do these measurements with sufficient time resolution such that you can re uh, resolve individual trajectories. So, and so for example, so here is a experiment, the slide that I stole from Michael Wood's side. So what, what you do is you're looking at, well, this is a protein folding. So unfortunately this is DNA hairpin here. So let's make it a protein. So you have a protein and you using optical tweezers to monitor extension of a protein as a function of time. So you have extension X as a function of time T and your time resolution is uh, sufficiently good that you can really resolve fine details of this trajectory. So for example, uh, you can zoom in on a jump here and you can see some details of this jump. Um, and, and so that's uh, one type of experiments. And another type of experiments is a FRET experiments that was uh, pioneered by uh, Bill Eaton and Hoison Chung, uh, where, so in the FRET case, it's a little bit more complicated because you're not really monitoring some extensions in real, as a, in, in real time. Instead of that, you're looking at the photon arrival time um, in, uh, Photo, uh, photon arrival times. And, and then you need to convert this into 
trajectory, and it's a highly non-trivial way, and uh, Irina Gopic and Attila Zaba taught us how to do that. Uh, but at any rate, so let's uh, for a second forget about all these experimental details. So let's say I have a trajectory like that, x of t. And the question I want to ask is uh, first two questions. First one is what's a good model of motion along this coordinate x? I call it reaction coordinate, by the way. So this is the usual notation. But really, in practical application, your reaction coordinate is simply your experimental signal or something related to it. So that's the first question. The second question is, um, is the hard inverse problem. So if I have a model like that, what does it tell me about the underlying physics or underlying dynamics of a protein? And I would like to be able to answer these questions given experimental constraints, such as limited time resolution, limited spatial resolution, noise, and so on. Now, mathematically, what we're dealing with is a sort of the projected dynamics. So you have a highly multidimensional process in which we have all the positions of all atoms in the protein, but we have projected it on just one degree of freedom X. So we have a low dimensional process. And uh, there's been quite a bit of work in the 20th century um, on how to do that. And uh, I would like to single out particularly work by Bob Swansick who show that you, in fact, you can get exact equations of motion for X. Um, unfortunately, they are very complicated and usually nearly intractable. And that's the reason why we almost never use it in practice. Uh, there's been some recent success in actually making useful, but most of the time they are exact, but they are not practically very useful. Um, there is another approach. There is another approach that goes back to Kramers, who said, well, let's just uh, deal with this model in a phenomenological way. So let's just assume that there is one special coordinate, x. Uh, so he was actually thinking about chemical, chemical reactions. So he said, there's one special vibrational mode. And let's model the effect of all other modes as some kind of friction. So he basically used the theory of Brownian motion. Um, Dima, it seems we have it seems we have a lot of problems. And it seems we have it seems we have a lot of problems with spectrum. Yeah, what? What's happening? Ah, now you're back. Now you're back. Can you repeat the last two sentences? Yeah. So Kramers uh, proposed to use, uh, apply the idea to many different phenomena, such as chemical reactions and nuclear reactions. Um, and But he was also, I, I know that many people heard about Kramers, but uh, very few people actually read his paper. And if you read his paper, you, you find a dire warning. Uh, here it is. So it, it may be, of course, that the uh, distinction of a particular reactive vibration, which is subject to perturbation from other vibrations, is no longer sound, and that consequently a one-dimensional model of the transition state is largely at fault. And there are many reasons to expect that this would be the case, because Brownian motion, Brown, uh, the theory of Brownian motion was developed for micron-sized particles in liquid, where you can apply Stokes law. But there is no good reason why it should apply to some arbitrary reaction coordinate that's coupled to other coordinates in a very complicated way. OK, so before I proceed, I, I want to, uh, uh, so one of the very important concepts in my talk is going to be Markov process. So let me just uh, spend a few minutes about uh, explaining what that means. So Brownian motion, if you think about it, is a random walk. So you have a random walk, and the Markov property means that every time I make a step, I don't need to know what happened before. So I make a step, I decide with some, I throw a flip a coin, for example, I decide where to go to make a step, but my decision does not, is not affected by, by, by the past. 
For example, I could also imagine that every time I make a step, I say, well, I actually came, my previous step was up, right? So my next step should be down, something like that. And when you do that, you end up with a non-market process, a process that has memory, okay? And so the key feature of Brownian motion is that it is a market process. It has no memory. So your future only depends on now. It does not depend on the past. Okay, so now how can we characterize Berry crossing dynamics? So, well, so let's let's say we have some dynamics, Brownian, might, might be Brownian motion, might be something else in some potential. And we are particularly interested in what happens when we cross the barrier. Of course, we can also ask the question, what happens when I'm spending my time in the wells? And by the way, uh, if we talk about protein folding, so this is a folded state maybe, and this is unfolded, or the other way around. And so we're particularly interested in what happens when we cross the free energy barrier. And so the way to, we study that, and that's how uh, Michael would cite, for example, studies in practice, we, we define two boundaries and we call what's in between a transition region. And now we, we want to know what happens when we look at trajectory in this transition region. And so every time particle enters this region, we can have two things. We can look at, we can have a loop in which the particle hangs around in the barrier region and then escapes it. Or we can have transition path in which uh, the particle successfully crosses the, this transition region. Now, both are interesting. Uh, it turns out that the loops are very difficult to study because they tend to be very short. Uh, and so most of the people uh, focus on transition paths. And the simplest property that was originally measured by Bill and by Michael is the, the time, transition path time. Okay, and if you want to learn uh, sort of more, uh, those times have some unusual properties. And if you, this is a shameless self-promotion. So uh, if you wanna read about them more, uh, we published two books. Uh, the one on the left is sort of a very basic one. And the one on the right is a little bit uh, more hardcore just because my co-authors, Ron Elber and Henry Orland, are both hardcore. Um, and in the case of Brownian motion, uh, we pretty much have a very good idea how they work. We have a theory, we, we know how to compute or sometimes even calculate analytically the distribution of transition path time, the mean transition path time, we, we know all that. And so here is what we, we're looking at the folding of a small protein. Uh, so this is a simulation by D. Shaw group. Uh, and we have some reaction coordinate and we define the transition region in some way and we compute the transition path time and we calculate the distribution of this time. Uh, and the distribution you see is this histogram that you see. And then we say, well, let's um, uh, try to see if Brownian motion model works in this case. And to do that, we simply take the potential of mean force, the free energy, which we know, and we have one adjustable parameter and that's the diffusivity. And we fit it in such a way that the mean of the distribution is the same as the actual distribution. And what we see is that um, the distribution that we see, uh, the, the, the Brownian motion model actually fails both at short times and at long times. So it misses the tail. So there's a very long tail, which you can see on the log scale. So all of those events should not happen if you have Brownian motion, but also it fails at short times. So you see it misses the speak at a very short time. Uh, we also see that uh, the motion along the reaction coordinate of this packet is not diffusive, but subdiffusive. Uh, and uh, similar observation was made, it's, it's less dramatic, but it was also made by uh, in, in by Michael Wood's side, but I think it was actually Ellie Pollock who pointed out that there is an issue here. So what they see is that they can fit their data using Brownian motion model, but the barrier that comes out of that, it turns out to be lower than it should be, lower than the actual barrier. And 
as you see in the second, the lower barrier means broader distribution. So in a sense, the distribution is broader than it should be given the, the free energy that they measure. Um, okay, so since uh, we start talking about uh, the width of the distribution, so let's characterize the width of the distribution. So the simplest way is to uh, define the coefficient of variation, which is simply the standard deviation divided by the mean. So it tells you how the relative width of the distribution, because of course, absolute width is not very interesting. So let's look at it, how it, how it behaves. So here uh, I have a simple potential barrier and I'm gonna make it lower and lower, 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 lower. And eventually I'm gonna make, make it a, a potential well and so on. And so what you see is that, so this is the high barrier and I make it lower, 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 the distribution gets broader, broader and broader. And eventually it gets to almost exponential distribution. And so the coefficient of variation uh, at high barrier is some small number and eventually it will approach one. So one is exponential distribution gives you coefficient of variation equal to one. Okay. Uh, so now the question is, can we have a model that has a broader distribution? So um, in, in fact, so let me show you some, some simulation data. So here we collected some simulation data. So this is folding of a protein, but this data is actually loop formation. So this is a process in which you have a unstructured protein, IDP, and it, the, the ends of a protein meet and form a loop. So this is a loop formation. Um, and in all of these cases, we see the coefficient of variation, which exceeds one, which means that the distribution we're looking at is broader than exponential. And so the question is, can we come up with some kind of a simple model that explains that? And the sort of the simplest, the most naive idea that we had was, well, we know that the potential uh, sort of, there's some roughness, right? So the potentials of, energy landscapes of proteins have some roughness. So let's make a rough energy landscape. And so this is a problem that is well familiar to the community who study things like continuous time, random walks and anomalous diffusion. So imagine that you have a rugged landscape and you have a bunch of potential wells. So, so there are traps, so there are traps. So let's say the depth of the trap is E. Uh, and let's say we have some distribution of the depth of the trap. So let's say we can make it exponential. And then let's say that the time to escape, the mean lifetime of escaping from the well obeys the Arrhenius law. So tau of E is proportional to E to beta E. And then we can calculate, so what's the distribution of tau? Uh, well, if you do the calculation, you're going to find out the distribution of tau actually is going to be a power law. And under certain conditions, you're going to find out that, uh, well, first of all, power law means that you have a heavy tail, you have a broad tail, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, and you can also have a situation in which all of the distribution moments actually diverge, except for the zero moment, which is one. So it's a normalizable, but all the moments diverge. So this is a sort of a standard picture that model that people use uh, uh, in, in people like, for example, like Klafter. Um, and so we thought that surely that model is gonna give us a broad distribution. And um, well, it doesn't. What, what, what we discovered and was a big surprise to us, and it's still a big surprise to me in a sense, even though I, I I, I know the answer now, but, but we, we discovered that it, it's not true. You, you always, for this model, the coefficient of variation is less than one, always, no matter what. Uh, so we really tested it by simulations and eventually we convinced ourselves that it must be true. So if it must be true, then we should be able to prove that. And so that was uh, our coronavirus project. It all happened in early summer, uh, 2020. And uh, Sasha uh, Berishkovsky, who's a very old fashioned theoretician. So he needs to talk on the phone or Skype. So we we're having, we're stuck at home and we're talking to each other almost every day over Skype. 
and we generated uh, multiple failed proofs of this and eventually we actually found a successful one so so basically this is my first theory so for Brown, brownian motion in any potential one dimensional brownian motion any potential the coefficient of variation is going to be less than one so the distribution is always more narrow than exponential uh, i'd be happy to uh, outline the proof but uh, i'm not going to do that but essentially the proof is based on uh, Sasha's idea that you can derive sort of a chain of equation in which you if you know lower moments of the distribution, you can calculate the higher moments. So you start with a zeroth moment of your distribution, which is one, which is just the integral of the probability. And then that allows you to derive the equation for the first moment, the mean transition path time, and then you get the second moment. And if you wish, you don't have to stop there. You can calculate higher and higher moments if you want. And then you simply stick it into the equation, definition of coefficient variation, and you prove the inequality. Now, I have to say that I still don't understand the physical origin of this result. I, it, really, it really baffles me. I don't have any intuition. If you ask me, can I explain that physically? I don't know. In fact, uh, recently, um, Alias Godek, who's a very smart mathematician from Göttingen, so they came up with a different proof. And so I was uh, virtually visiting them and I asked them if they can explain to me my own result. And they told me, no, our proof is even more complicated than yours. Uh, so I don't know. If anybody has a good idea why this is the case, I would be very glad to, to hear about that. All right. And so the consequence of that is that when we see coefficient variation which exceeds one, then it tells us that no matter how hard we try, the one dimensional Brownian motion cannot explain your data, okay? So all of this data, all of this simulation data we're looking at, it cannot be explained by the single model. Now, here's one other example that sort of emphasizes this point. Um, so here's what we did, we took uh, uh, one of the, favorite proteins in this area, HIV integrase, and we constructed a Markov state model. So Markov state model basically clusters, attempts to find basins of attraction in the dynamics, and then it models the dynamic as, as a random walk on a network, whatever that network is. And so we ended up with this very complicated network, uh, and we use this network to compute distribution of transition path times, and it turns out to be pretty much the same as for the original dynamics. Uh, but then what we did, we, we decided, well, let's flatten the energy landscape. So in other words, what we did is that, so in this network, all nodes have different energies, but we can flatten it by simply forcing them to have exactly the same energy. And when you do that, you end up with a different distribution of transition path time, but the coefficient of variation is greater than one in both cases. So in other words, that shows you that it's not the roughness of energy landscape, but it's topology of the network, which is responsible for a broad distribution. So what is the physics behind that? So uh, let me try to sort of suggest what the physics might be. Uh, so here is sort of a very simple model in which you have two pathways. So imagine, uh, you have a two-dimensional energy landscape and you have two saddle points. And so there are two pathways that take you from, from your initial state to the final state. I'm not claiming that this is a model for protein dynamics. I'm just saying this is a toy model that illustrates what's happened. And so let's say we have a distribution, certain distribution of um, transition path time for, for the first pathway for the second one. And then we simply calculate the distribution by taking the average between the two and calculate the coefficient variation. It turns out that if the mean transition path for one pathway is very different from the other one, then you always end up with the coefficient variation of variation, which is greater than one. So you always end up with a broad distribution. Uh, and and so, so for a single pathway, you don't get that, but if you have multiple pathways, then you end up with a broad distribution. And again, I emphasize that if you simply have very rugged one dimensional landscape, your coefficient variation is always less than one. And if you want to see a sort of a more 
uh, less trivial and more realistic example of, of this thing playing out, there's a paper by from Eugene Shaknovich where they also show how this broad distribution comes out of um, multiple pathways. Another way to think about is, is that you, you have to have dynamical disorder, not a static disorder. So here's again, so if you have a rugged landscape and it's very rough, but it's static, it doesn't change in time. So that's a static disorder. But if you have dynamical disorder, one way to think about that, that, that is that, let's say you have some degrees of freedom Y that you don't see, and you have degree of freedom X that you do see. So as you move along Y, your potential that you see along X changes, right? So instantaneous potential along X might have some ripples and whatnot, but this disorder is, unlike the first case, this disorder is dynamic, so it's changing over time. And so, so the claim is that you need, if you want to have a broad distribution, you need this type of disorder. What about experiments? Well, so, um, if you look at Michael Woodside's data, you find that uh, the coefficient variation is less than one. However, as I mentioned before, uh, their distributions appear to be broader than expected. Now, in, in uh, the work from Ben Schuler, uh, in which I sort of played a very modest role, uh, so they looked at um, binding of two proteins and define an exponential distribution of transition path times. So the coefficient variation is equal to one, roughly speaking. And that was interpreted as having a on-pathway intermediate. Now, uh, there is a recent paper, a really beautiful paper by uh, Hoi Sung Chung uh, in science in which they use a three color fret to look at, uh, again, transition path times for protein binding. And what they, because they have three color, they can actually learn more about the, they define that actually there are several classes, two different classes of, there are two clusters, if you like, of transition paths, and they have different properties. And uh, after I read this paper, I, I emailed Hoi Sun and asked him, can you calculate the coefficient variation for your distribution? And he wrote back to me saying that, well, uh, it is greater than one, Okay, which is kind of makes sense because again, so you have two pathways. I just gave you an example, but you have two typical pathways uh, with different average five times, and it's going to be one greater than one. But what's interesting is that for if you analyze, if he analyzes just each one separately, he finds that for one of them, coefficient variation is less than one, but for the, the other one is greater than one. So you have this pathway heterogeneity, if you like, even. Um, even for just one pathway. So there's something more, it's not just two pathways. Okay, so at this point I'd like to pause and I'd like to uh, sort of ask a question, maybe somebody in the audience actually can answer it because I think that this is, this is a very interesting question to which I don't know the, the answer. So what does it mean? So I, I claim that to have a broad distribution you have some kind of a diverse ensemble of pathways, right? But what does it really mean? So is there any number that would allow me to quantify pathway diversity, right? And you can, I can argue that this coefficient of variation is one example, but it's not very direct, right? And so, uh, so what, how, and the reason why I think it's very, um, Interesting is because I sort of, I, and I think for people in folding, maybe it's not, it's not a sort of a surprising question because if I think about sort of a funnel picture, so I have old roads going to Rome, right? So there are different pathways, but they all diverge. But at the same time, we use a simple one dimensional picture, right? Uh, and, and so there's no contradiction between the two. And in fact, uh, for students in the audience, I'd like to illustrate it by, by a very simple model, which is goes back to, uh, Attila Zaba's work. So this is a toy model of folding. So let's say you have a sphere. It could be a multi-dimensional sphere. And there is a little patch in the middle. And I'm gonna call this folded. 
and the rest of it is unfolded. You can think about this looking at the funnel from the top. And if you give it some energetic bias, there's going to be a funnel. But in fact, you don't have to. Let's don't give it. Let's just say that there's free diffusion here. So the particle just freely diffuses. So this is a golf course landscape, if you like. And so ask the question. Uh, so how heterogeneous is the ensemble of pathways that take me to, to the middle? And you can say, well, it is as heterogeneous as, 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 you, can, as you can imagine, right? Because there's uh, any path, it's just free diffusion. So any way you get to the middle, right? So if, for example, if I try to define some kind of a path entropy, which you can do, you're gonna conclude that you have a very high pathway entropy. And so it's a highly heterogeneous ensemble. However, it is known that if I use the distance from the center as reaction coordinate, I can exactly reduce this model to one dimensional problem. So I can reduce this problem to one dimensional problem in a potential of mean force that looks like this, maybe. So this is R, uh, I don't know, it's gonna look like this, I think. So it's exactly, and so if I probe the system experimentally, if you can imagine, you can probe it experimentally. If I measure, for example, the coefficient of variation, C it's gonna be less than one. So there is no pathway diversity. And, and so I, once I convinced myself that this is the case, I, I decided that I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, I really don't know how to, uh, I think this is an open question in my opinion, unless somebody has done it already and I don't know about that. All right. Okay, so uh, conclusion so far, so, it is fundamentally hopeless to try describing certain processes observed by single mo molecule methods as one dimensional diffusion or Brownian motion. And we have a way of telling when to give up. Um, and the second one is that when you see a broad distribution, uh, you need to invoke multidimensionality or equivalently dynamical disorder or equivalently non Markov dynamics in order to explain that. Okay. Now, I don't have much time. I don't want to take too much of your time. So, so let me just, uh, I'm going to prove two more theorems. I'm going to state two more theorems. So, uh, people like Michael Woodside and other single molecule people, of course, uh, are not limited to measuring things like transition path time. They can also measure all kinds of other dynamics. So, basically, they see a trajectory and you can calculate the average shape of your path. You can calculate average velocity and whatnot. Uh, and so the question is basically, if I look at trajectory, so let, let's say somebody gives me X of T, can I, uh, can I tell if it's a Markov process or not? And it turns out that there is a very simple criterion. So that's my theorem number two. So here's the idea. Again, we're gonna choose some transition region and we're gonna pick some point X inside this region. And then we ask, so what, where did that come from and where does it go? So it could be, for example, that it came from the reactant or the folded state or unfolded state, whatever that is, and it goes back to the reactant. Or maybe it came from your unfolded state and went back to the folded state. Or it maybe it came from the unfolded state or reactant and end up in a product. So in a lot of, in a latter case, we're looking at transition path. Uh, I can calculate the probability that point X belongs to transition path. And it turns out that if you have a Markov process, that the maximum value of this probability is equal to one fourth. One fourth if you're talking about transition paths going from left to right, or one half if I don't care about direction of transition path. And it turns out uh, so this is actually a very simple process. Essentially, I can, I can explain why it, it's the case. So basically, if it's a Markov process, then this piece and this piece are statistically independent. And I can simply calculate the probability that it belongs to the transition path as the probability that it came from A times the probability that goes to B, which is one minus P. And the maximum value of this number is equal to one fourth when P is equal to one half. So that's really all there is to it. 
Uh, but it turns out that if you uh, have a non-Markov process, then it's always less than one fourth. And you can prove it. The proof is kind of trivial. Uh, it's uh, basically the idea is that if you think about your Markov process as non-Markov process as a projection of, again, of high dimensional process on one degree of freedom. So you can still do the same result in multidimensional space. So this, is, this picture is true in multidimensional space, but then you have to project out other degrees of freedom. And when you do that, it turns out that you end up with this inequality. And here is a demonstration of this uh, again. So we're talking about the folding of, of a protein from the show simulation and we plot the probability that the point X belongs to, to a transition path as a function of X. And it turns out that it's much less than 0 0.25. So we know that the, more, the process is very non markov Interestingly enough, Michael Woodside sees this kind of behavior in, in his experiments. But in, in, in his case, uh, he finds that the main source of this non markov behavior is not the intrinsic dynamics of, of the protein that he studies, but the coupling between the protein and the the beads in the instrument. So because that coupling by itself introduced non markov effects. All right, now, finally, let me tell you about my last theory. So uh, now I want to move on to non-equilibrium systems. So let's say we look at a motion of a molecular motor that walks along its track. And so here is an example of experimental trajectory where you look at trajectory and you see that, well, you know, it's, it's a random walk basically, right? It's a biased random walk. So it goes forward, but sometimes it steps back. Uh, and uh, it could be argued that uh, it's advantageous for motors to be close to equilibrium, which means that it's not just walking forward. Sometimes it goes back because that makes efficiency high. Um, and so, uh, so here is a simple model of non-equilibrium dynamics. So I have a simple sort of a tilted periodic potential like this, and it's only slightly tilted. So you're looking at it goes forward and goes backward, goes forward, goes backward and so on. Um, now, I'd like to mention one interesting property of uh, transition path time. It turns out that the forward path and backward path are statistically equivalent. So in other words, the distribution of uh, transition path time going from A to B is the same as the one from B going to A. And this is, of course, it's an almost trivial result. It's simply a uh, consequence of time reversal symmetry. So we know that if we watch this movie, if I play this movie backward in time, you would not be able to tell that it's going backward in time it would look the same. So in other words, my trajectory, if I run it backward in time, it's gonna be statistically the same. And that immediately gives you the symmetry. Uh, and some people find it counterintuitive because it in particular tells you, for example, that if you go downhill here, or here you go uphill, so somewhat counterintuitive, the distribution or any statistical properties of the paths going downhill, uphill is, is in fact the same. But now let's break the symmetry. So let's say now we are in non-equilibrium situation. I have uh, a tilted periodic potential. So now I doing a, I'm doing a biased random walk uh, and I go forward more frequently than going backwards. Uh, and if I play this movie backwards, it's not gonna be the same movie. So there is no time reversal symmetry anymore. Now, if I sort of take my transition region and I periodically replicate that, and then I'm gonna study the forward transition path. So it's all replicated. And I also I'm gonna see occasionally I'm gonna go backwards. And now I'd like to ask the question. So is the distribution of paths going forward the same as those going backwards? Now I cannot use my time reversal symmetry argument because my dynamics is non-equilibrium and I have direction of time. It turns out that if you have one D Brownian motion, 
then indeed you're not going to break the symmetry. So the symmetry is preserved. I can prove it to you right now. It's very simple. The idea again is that one dimensional Brownian motion is a Markov process. What that means that if I inject the particle here, so let's say I, I found the tradition path. So I inject the particle here and I watch it move because it's a Markov process. It doesn't care where it came from. It doesn't know anything about its past. And that means that it doesn't know anything about what's happening outside this gray area. So it does not know about what's happening here and here. It doesn't know about what's happening outside the transition region. That means that I can modify my potential in any way you like, as long as I preserve the shape of the potential inside the transition region, I'm still gonna get the same answer. Well, I'm gonna modify it like this. I'm gonna make it a double well. And so now I have an equilibrium situation and I know the answer. So there's a symmetry. So the symmetry is preserved. So if you have a mark of dynamics, the symmetry is always preserved. So this is just the illustration of that. So here's the theorem number three, and this one is a little bit subtle. I'm not gonna give you any details, but it turns out that this forward backward symmetry of transition paths is broken only for the dynamics that are simultaneously non-equilibrium and non-Markovian. So if your dynamics is equilibrium, if you're in equilibrium, then it doesn't matter if you mark up or non mark up. You're still gonna have the symmetry. However, if you happen to be away from equilibrium and at the same time, the dynamics is non mark up, then the symmetry is broken. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. I just wanted to mention uh, that of course, uh, so today I focused on transition paths and particularly on the times. But of course there are many other properties of trajectories that you can measure. For example, you can measure the effective velocity. You can measure the effective shape. You can also try to model your data using, for example, something like a generalized Langevin equations. You can do, and in fact, there is a method by which you can extract the memory kernel if you have the data. Um, and so there are lots of opportunities here, but it is, uh, the, the complication is, of course, that you, you have a sort of a limited time resolution. And I always find it quite fascinating that the, the time resolution of Michael Woodside experiments, for example, is about one microsecond. Well, one microsecond is a very, very, very long computer simulation of a, of a protein, or it used to be very long simulation of a protein. So really the time resolution is quite limited. Uh, and, and so the question is, would all of those methods work if you have these experimental constraints? And so here, uh, uh, Ben uh, came up with this really beautiful experimental system, uh, which on one hand has all the experimental limitations, but on the other hand, we know what the answer should be. So this is a dual optical trap. So you have a little mic micron sized bead that is trapped in a dual optical trap. And so that effectively creates a double well potential and you can look at very long trajectories, you can study all, the, all these things and you can really test how those methods work. And uh, fortunately for us, and many of them actually do work very well. Uh, and of course we know the answer in this case, so we know uh, when they work and when they don't. Okay, so, uh, so where do we go from here? Well, uh, first of all, I, I hope I convinced you that maybe it's time to move on beyond simple phenomenological models for the time evolution experimental signals. So we don't have to stick to simple one dimensional models such as the Kramers model. Uh, if it works, it works, but if it doesn't, then we, we, there are opportunities how we can move on. There are data driven methods for uh, single molecule analysis, for example, the method that uh, by, by Gopich and Zaba and uh, the method by Gilad. Uh, there's a whole suite of methods developed by Steve Presse. Uh, and so there are lots of opportunities. Um, the other observation is that, um, you know, for a long time, I tried to convince my colleagues who do experiments, but we really should think about non-Markov phenomena. 
Uh, and they're not very convinced. They say that, well, sure, but it's, uh, you know, the Brownian motion is good enough. It's a good enough approximation, it fits the data. And uh, what I hope I showed you is that there are cases where Brownian dynamics is not even the good zero to four approximation. You cannot, it doesn't capture the physics at all. And, uh, and so I want to remind us of the famous quote by Van Kampen, who, by the way, was a PhD student of Kramer's, who said that non Markov is the rule, Markov is the exception. Um, now, finally, you may, may have noticed that even though I told you how we can tell when Markovian assumption in dynamics is not true, but if that's the case, I haven't told you what to do next. So what if, if Brownian motion dynamics, Brownian dynamics is, is a lousy model. So what's a good model? Uh, and there are some ideas, of course, and we, we have worked on that a little bit. For example, generalized Langevin equations could be one, but, but, but whenever I think about all these models of non-Markovian non -Markovian dynamics, anomalous diffusion and so on, uh, I always I'm always reminded of, of the quote from famous Russian novel, Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, it's the first sentence. So happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And so there's only one diffusion model. There's only one diffusion equation. So that's a happy family. All the, ha all, all the Markov models are more or less the same. Uh, but there is a whole zoo of anomalous diffusion models, non-Markov models, and there are like unhappy families, there are lots of them. And uh, I think that we still don't really know which one is the one that we should use. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of work on this. So I just, so this is a sort of a very partial list of papers which uh, try to examine the effect of non-Markov phenomena on, on uh, dynamics of barrier crossing. Uh, but I think we, we still sort of don't know what's, what's a good, what's a good way to describe uh, systems like that. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dima, for this terrific talk and, and overview. And uh, we already have uh, the first comment by Peter, Peter Wallinus. Peter, please. Oh, well, uh, um, yes. Um, well, first of all, it was fun to hear references to Bob Zwanzig and to Van Kampen, I can tell you that both of them really uh, enjoyed a good martini and uh, were quite different with a martini than they were um, in, in giving seminars. Um, well, uh, Peter, I know that your, your martinis are quite amazing. That's, that's I, right. I it's part it of the tradition. And of course, this comment about Crummer's paper not being read is something that I uh, uh, very much resonated with uh, 30 years ago when uh, we rediscovered the Cromer's paper. Many other people didn't know what was in it. But, um, but I should also mention that um, in terms of papers that are cited more than they're read, there's one that's quite relevant to this. Uh, there, there's the second paper of Bringelson and Wallinus, which is in the Zwanzig Festschrift. And in that paper, most of the paper is about a non-Markovian model of uh, a protein folding. Uh, it involves, you know, knowing the distributions of um, trap depths, um, and um, and uh, it has. A, 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 it turns out there's several regimes. One of which is the exponential regime that you talked about at the beginning, but there's um, there's a bunch of other regimes uh, written there, and it also discusses the distribution of um, of folding times, not of traversal times, but of folding times, and, and does conclude that there's a regime in which you get long, uh, long tails. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that might be worth looking at that paper, although I, I actually was just glancing at it while you were talking, and it did, did remind me that it's extremely technically written. And uh, that's why we wrote the leather, later paper with Jose, where we made everything uh, Markovian. Um, mm -hmm. There, there's another paper with Jose uh, and Jin Wang um, from the 90s, uh, in which we talk about the change from having many paths to few paths in a non-Markovian 
um, a, a many dimensional trap model. And I think that might help you with this other question. I mean, I think this also shows that how difficult it is for theorists to anticipate what experiments will be doable in the future. I, I think the, all those papers would be much better written, rewritten now, given the uh, fact that you can now measure transit times, whereas at that time, uh, nobody had even you know, a clue of how to do that. So anyway, those are more comments than questions. But Yeah, thanks, Peter. I, I actually, I, I do know the paper in its once and first, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I haven't looked at it uh, in, in a while. It's a very hard paper to read, even for me when I look back on it, because yeah. especially the things you're worrying about were things that we were trying to overcome and get just a good approximation to the overall folding time, because that's, of course, the right. big lesson that the overall folding is fast when you're above the glass transition and slow with long tails when you're below the right. glass transition. Right. So, and and so that was actually, the main point. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I should look at that because we actually recently looked at the distribution of first passage times, which is, I think, that's what, what you're doing. Yeah. And, and, and indeed, first passage time, the distribution can be very broad. Uh, so the, the transition path time is very unique in this respect. Well, well, also in your model, I mean, it's interesting, your model is one that's commonly invoked, which is that it's still one dimensional, but rugged. But I right. would say that in protein folding, it's important that it's many dimensional. Right. And rugged. Yeah, right. That, that, anyway, sorry, didn't want to take up all the questions. Hey, the next question is by David Lieberman. David, please. Hi, great talk, thanks so much. Um, I had a question uh, regarding what kind of ex kind of um, experimental signal you might see in um, frequency dependent calorimetry, um, especially if you were sitting at the um, at the at the uh, melting temperature. Um, I, I've seen papers where um, where at the melting temperature of a large protein, not these teeny little you know alpha helices things where things happen super fast. But in a large, like myoglobin kind of thing, you're talking about trend, you know, uh, relaxation times and the frequency heat dependent heat capacity at TM into the hundreds of milliseconds of you know large large structures moving around. And I was curious to see if you could make a statement about the distribution of folding or unfolding times of that fluctuation at the TM um, based on the frequency dependent heat capacity signal you'd see. So if you, it seems to me, if you had multiple unfolding transitions of a very large protein, which, you know, you know normally you get a two state process if you're not doing anything right. frequency dependent, but you could see easily multiple relaxation times and a frequency dependent measurement. And, um, and I'm curious to see if, if you could see changes in the, in the width of those, of those um, frequency dependent measurements. So uh, uh, first of all, let me admit that I know uh, nothing about this type of experiments, but I think I understand your question. So basically you're looking at some kind of relaxation time of the system. And for a two state system, you would have just the sum of the folding and folding rates, right? Something like that, Yeah. Of inverse of that. But now you're saying that actually you have, uh, in principle, you can have some kind of frequency Fourier transform signal that's gonna t give you the, distribution of relaxation times. Yeah, the Fourier, the, uh, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation constant would give you a frequency, essentially the normal mode frequencies right. of those relaxations. Right, so in principle, of course, we can, and again, that's, that's somewhat related to, to Peter's question. So, uh, so in principle, of course, we know how to uh, compute, at least for some models, we know how to compute the distribution of first passage times, which presumably would be related to, to the relaxation time that you see, even though I think this has to be done carefully. And uh, we do find, we, we just re recently, Sasha and I recently submitted a paper about, uh, in which we actually looked at the distribution of first passage times. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, uh, we can compute that. We can compute its moments. Uh, we know that it can't be broad, uh, but beyond that, I, you know, it, uh, we, we have to talk about specifics, I think. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see when you, of course, when you're looking at, you know, how long of a tail and, and uh, you know, essentially what the effect that would look like on an experiment when you're doing things in, you know, with not a single molecule, um, it, you know, you'd have kind of maybe hard to detect um, parts of it. But I, I, I think right. I see where you're going. Well, in general, it, it has uh, long tails. In fact, uh, so this kind of time, it commonly has long tails. Mm. You, can, you can show that even for very simple systems uh, that don't have any ruggedness of energy landscape or don't have any multidimensionality, you end up with long tails. Um, uh, so, but again, it, it depends, on, depends on the system. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so next question is by Ben. Thank you very much, Dima. I really enjoyed your talk very much. Thanks a lot. Um, I had a very basic question regarding a comment that you made in the very beginning. That's probably obvious to many of the theorists, but not to me. So you mentioned that uh, the Zwanzig projection operator formalism essentially is exact, almost always intractable, but there were exceptions. And I was wondering whether you could be more explicit about the exceptions where it is tractable. Oh, uh, well, uh... So there are some papers by uh, Eric van den Eyden, for example, where he tried to make it into a, a practical tool. But more recently, I came across um, a number of papers from, sorry, I don't remember the name, her name. She's in somewhere in Germany. And uh, sorry, I, I can, I can, find, I can tell you what, but ba but uh, basically what they're doing is they're trying to, so what we're trying to do and what Roland Ness, for example, tried to do is to, to get the generalized Langevin equation out of trajectory data, right? Which is very hard because of the sort of noise and other issues. Um, and, but what they are doing, they're trying to get the Swansix equation directly out of simulation data. And they claim that they do that. And another, actually another example is, uh, so there's work by uh, Elias Godek, where they also, I mean, they don't do it for some molecular simulations, they do it for some model system, but also they've been able to, to get the Swansic type equation directly out of, out of trajectories. And, and so, but again, I don't know any details. So these, these papers are actually sitting on my virtual desk and I, I meant to read them, but, but I, okay. I can't these, So these are all recent examples. This is a pretty recent, uh, Eric van den Eyden's work is not recent. It's maybe 10 years ago, uh, but yeah. The problem with this business is that, you know, there are two types of Langevin equations. So there's a generalized Langevin equation of potential mean force, right? And there's a Zwanzig equation. So the Zwanzig equation, at least the original one, the potential is always harmonic oscillator, it's always linear. So all the complexity, all the nonlinearity comes through noise. So this noise is very, very complicated object that is just, just ugly and, uh, because it has to capture all the nonlinearity. So Zwanzig actually has a chapter, I think chapter in, in his book discussing these two different Langevin equations. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, it seems like there's some some progress here. Thank you. Okay, so there, there is a rather general question by a student, Pratishruti Panda. Uh, Pratishruti, uh, do do you wanna do you wanna ask your question in person? Well, actually, her question is, what are the data-driven approaches for studying single molecule dynamics? I guess, what, what are the different methods? Well, to... so, uh, uh, of, of course, we have uh, Gilad here who can probably answer this question uh, better than... Uh, so, uh, the idea basically is that, you know, it's a time series analysis. So, so you have to assume some kind of a model, uh, uh, say some kind of a Markov state model. And, and then you use something like maximum likelihood or Bayesian analysis to, to sort of maximize your likelihood or whatever that is 
to get the uh, parameters of the model. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, um, unfortunately, you know, that, that means that you have to assume a model. So that's, that's a limitation, right? But, but there's been a lot of uh, work, for example, from Steve, Steve Press's group, where they work on uh, non uh, Bayesian non-parametrics, in which basically you try to relax the assumption of a model. You try to, uh, well, depends on who you talk to. Some people say it's a, it's a, it's a model-free approach, but I, I don't think it's a model-free approach, but, but it's, a, it's a, you sort of, you don't make any, any many assumptions about your model. So of course, uh, the problem is that, uh, and, and I think like maybe, maybe Gilad can comment on that. Uh, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, uh, if you have a Markov model, Markov state model with some non-trivial topology, it looks like you have a very large number of topologies, right? So what do you do? So if you have some linear non-Markov model or something, you have some, then, then you're okay. But if you have, if you want to fit your data to some kind of a Markov model with non-trivial topology, and you don't want to make too many assumptions about that topology, what do you do? I don't know. Maybe Gilad can tell tell us. Gilad, you wanna you wanna add something? Yeah, you, you shoot yourself in the head in that case. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before you do that, uh, let let's uh, uh, Lisa Lapidus ask a question. Lisa, please. I think actually there was a question before me. No, I think I, ah, there, there was Raphael. Oh, sorry, Raphael. I, I, should, I, should I go or it doesn't matter? Okay, so Lisa, ladies first. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, very nice talk, Dima. Uh, it seems like your, um, most of the conclusions you were drawing from the beginning were using these transition path times, which I totally agree is a great way to measure it. But as you can tell, there's very few experiments that can really measure those transition path times. It's, it's still experimentally really difficult. Um, so the question is, is can you start to say something about non-Markovian, um, uh, you know, are you, is it one dimensional, is it multi-dimensional, uh, one path, multi-path, can anything be, gathered from these kind of lower time resolution measurements that are, you know, 99% of the data that's out there. And I think you might've been starting to get to that with the with Ben's experiment with the beads, but I didn't quite get all of that. And I haven't read that paper yet. Um, can you get something from lower time resolution experiments? Um, So I think in, in, in our case, we really need time resolution. I mean, of course, there are, there are some cases where uh, you, you might be able to do something about deviation from Markov dynamics, even with, for example, maybe you, you will see some distribution of, path, like, I don't know, distribution of first passage times that is non-exponential, and you can say something about that. But, but, but uh, I think that in, in in our case, you really need to have, see the other thing is that we, we are particularly interested in what happens in the barrier. So you have to have enough time resolution to cross, you know, to resolve what's happening as you're crossing the barrier. I mean, there's no, there's no way to escape that. So if you, if you want to know, for example, about relaxation dynamics, it's a different story. And uh, uh, quite honestly, I haven't thought of that. So maybe there you can, you can do, uh, but, but you know, I, I think that at the end, there's no free lunch. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right about that, but I was just hoping. <laughs> thanks. Right. Okay, so next question, Rafael. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. So I had a question regarding this question you write, like is the protein folding pathway uh, a time reversal of the unfolding, right? And mm -hmm. so, is it like and like what what do you mean by that more precisely? And you had like this probability, uh, is it, was it probability from going from state A to state B as a function of time? Right. Um, 
So that was equal to like probability of going from B to A as a function. Yes. Okay. So you have to be uh, you have to be very careful when when talking about it because you it's easy to get yourself in trouble. So that's why let, let me make a more precise statement. So again, so let's say we have potential like that. Uh, and so I will define a transition path. And I say, so tra transition path is a path that enters this region, does something inside it and exit this region. So it's not allowed to come out. It's not allowed to go back. So I only look at these particular things. So I can simply, uh, you know, measure the time it took this path to, to go. So essentially experiment that I do is that every time my system enters the barrier, I start the clock. And if the system goes back, I just throw away this information. But if the system goes in and succeeds to come out, then I record this time. And then I say, what's the distribution of this time that I get from this experiment? And then I can do an experiment in which I do it backwards. So I start the clock here and I stop the clock here. And, and I get the distribution in this case. And my claim is that this, this distribution is exactly the same. However, you can ask a different question. So if I start at this point, and I ask how, how long it's gonna take me to get to this point, okay? So I start here, I do whatever, and I get to this point. So that's the first passage time. And, and then I start the clock here, and I ask how much time it's gonna take me to, to get to, to this point. These times are different. So the first passage time, the distributions are different. So we know that the rate of downhill, for example, reaction, is going to be in this case is going to be faster than the rate of uphill reaction or equivalently the the well yeah so so, so, yeah, so this, very uh, yeah so this uh, transition path time distributions right from a to b and right. from b to a so right. it was implying only for one dimensional landscape or is general no it's completely general uh, of course, your transition path time is defined in terms of is defined in terms of um, longer the one dimension coordinate. But your dynamics could be anything you want. If you're in equilibrium, you always have the symmetry. Well, so for example, I'm let's say let's imagine we are in two dimensional surface. Yeah, uh, and you are going uh, from A to B along one uh, path, mm -hmm. for example. And from B to A along with another one, always. Right? No, 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 no. But uh, sure, you can come up with a dynamics that is like that. But this dynamics yeah. will violate the time reversal symmetry. So, and indeed, you can have the scenario if you're not in equilibrium. But if you're in equilibrium, this, this is not going to happen. Yeah, but you are in equilibrium, right? Your landscape is not changing, it's not function of time, no? your free energy landscape is not changing with time. Well, you can still have, an, like in this potential, you're not in equilibrium, even though the potential is not changing with time. But if you have a potential like this, then you always have time reversal symmetry. Even if you have multiple pathways, you simply cannot, uh, you cannot have a, so you the scenario that you have in mind is that you go this way along this, pathway and you go backwards along this pathway yeah. that's possible in non-equilibrium system it's not it's not possible in system that is in equilibrium okay that's going to violate detailed balance i see thanks okay next question is by david nesbitt david please yeah dimitri thank you very much you know uh really very thought-provoking and certainly reminds us that we always need to go back to Anna Karenina, right? And reread Anna Karenina. <laughs> of course. Um, it, I, it, I have a question that sort of builds a little bit on leases. Uh, I, my own interests, or at least my own skill set, tends to be more applicable to uh, nucleic acid uh, dynamics. And I'm wondering, you know, when you've got polyanionic systems, 
you know, in what way you know, versus, let's say, protein folding, in what way might you imagine some of your trickier conclusions to, uh, to vary? Uh, the opportunity might be that with nucleic acid, you might be able to slow down uh, you know, transition state uh, crossings and whatnot in ways that might make them physically more accessible. And even the example that you chose from uh, Michael Woodside was uh, polyanonic, uh, you, know, you know, DNA hairpin formation. So, you know, in, is, it the, is it the case that if one turns on polyanionic behavior in these polymers that the story changes qualitatively or doesn't change much at all? What do you think? Well, uh, so again, uh, what I know about this is because Michael did experiments both for proteins and for nucleic acids. And uh, my understanding is that uh, his story is similar for both cases, however, uh, so he has a bunch of different uh, DNA hairpin constructs, and some of them behave in a very unusual way. And so I, I remember th there was a so there was a uh, in one of his papers he studies the quantity which is like the uh, velocity with which you cross the barrier. Now, this is a kind of a funny quantity because it's not a thermal velocity. Thermal velocity is, is huge. It's very, very, very high. You cannot measure that. But this some kind of, it's some kind of a coarse grain average velocity. It turns out that you can define that. Uh, and what he finds in one of his, for one of his hairpins that this, this velocity really has a very unusual distribution. And, Basically, so actually, I think that he was the first, uh, he basically suggests, where, where is that? Uh, he kind of suggested this, they, they think that you, you actually have a rough landscape like this, where's my, so you, you have a landscape like this. So they really think that it, it has to be, uh, so I think that sure, I mean, by, by playing with a, uh, playing with your uh, sequence and playing with electrostatics, you can probably do interesting things. And I think that also, if, for example, if you do it at uh, uh, low salt, then you can make your system maybe even glassy, I don't know, right? And you can slow things down. So I think that, yes, you can certainly I, I think it, you, you're right in a sense that it's a, it could be a sort of a more controlled way of looking at these things. Well, thank you. I, I, I would just hope that work in that area doesn't just get perceived as crime and punishment uh, uh, <laughs> to follow your analogy. <laughs> okay, so Gilad, you're next. So Dima, you mentioned this problem of uh, recrossing trajectories, uh, basically the trajectories that go back. And you, right. you, you said that they are uh, always very short, so it's difficult to measure them. But I yeah. wonder if, if that's really the case, because as long as you don't lose energy on the top of the barrier, you could go pretty far before you turn back and, and return, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so let me... Uh, so this is something that actually we studied. So this is, we, we, Sasha and I just submitted a paper about that. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about the property of this. Um, oops, that's different. Oh, where is my, I need a blank. Okay, here's a blank thing. So, um, so you basically say, I have a trajectory. I enter this region and then I go do a loop. And you're saying that, of course, 
you can have a very long loop, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so now it turns out, first of all, uh, it's, it turns out that the distribution of, if you assume Brownian dynamics, then if the distribution of this time is a delta function. Now, this is very funny mathematically, right? Because uh, you're saying that uh, you, you can actually go far, but it's sort of uh, almost trivial because uh, it simply tells you that if I start at the absorbent boundary, I will never leave the absorbent boundary if you have diffusion. Now, there are two ways to deal with that. One is that you say that if you include inertial effects, so you have some velocity, then you will not, even if you started this, this boundary is gonna be some time, but it's gonna be very short because once you forget about your velocity, you, you go back. Now, let me sort of uh, explain what really goes on here. Um, so if you, so maybe, Imagine the following experiment. I start not exactly at the boundary, but at some point epsilon here, okay? So in other words, my particle crossed this boundary, but I only detected it when, because maybe I have a finest spatial resolution. So I started some point epsilon here. And I ask the question, what's the distribution of the loop time to go back? So that's a well-defined problem. It turns out, that this distribution looks like this. It's gonna be power law and it's gonna be non-analytic function like this. So the distribution is gonna look like this. It's gonna have a very sharp peak here. So it's gonna be really this very sharp peak dominating at very short time. It's non-analytic function. So it's, it's, it just explodes at zero. And then it has a power law tail. And this power law tail is exactly what, you, what you're talking about, right? So that's the your trajectory can go very far before it comes back. But unfortunately you have this part and this part is a problem because of course you, you have a finite time resolution and so basically most of the events you're gonna see is gonna be this, this like almost like a Delta function, most of the events. And most of those events are actually not gonna be measurable, right? Because you don't have a time resolution. And so the question is how to do it experimentally. So what we proposed being theoreticians was said that you have to, instead of looking at this loop in time, you look at exit time. So you say that suppose that I catch my trajectory at some point x zero and I ask the question, how long does it take me to, to exit the transition region in either direction? So, so this is a very interesting time. In fact, uh, we, uh, uh, Ron Elber and I and his student wrote a paper proposing that this can be used as reaction. This exit time is a good reaction coordinate. But in this case, we just proposed to measure this. And if you, you have a freedom to choose this point x zero. And so I think if you choose it somewhere in the middle, it's gonna be a good quantity to look at. So it's somewhat, it's a more general object than the transition path time. But I think if you really look at this return time, it's gonna be all dominated by short events and those you're not gonna capture. So, so that means that basically what you're gonna measure is gonna be dependent on the time resolution that you have or spatial resolution that you have. Okay, interesting, thank you. Okay, and next question is by Maran. Maran, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I just have one question is, uh, most of your talk was mainly concerned by the distribution of the times of uh, the transition bats. And I was wondering if any information can be extracted also from the actual shape of the transition bats. Is, is there something or certain properties that uh, connect to your, uh, to your uh, observations that you can extract from the actual shape of the, uh, of the transition? Right, uh, this is a very good question, but that would, that, that would, be, a, a, that would be another talk. 
because uh, this is something that uh, quite a few people worried about it. And so indeed you can, uh, there are several different ways in which you can define the average shape. Uh, and Roland Nets worked on that and then we worked on that. And then uh, uh, Attila Zaba and Gerhard Hammer and Pilar Corsi worked on that. And so there are, and Michael Woodside worked on that. So there are di different proposals it turns out that it's a little bit tricky. It depends, there are several different definitions of the, of the average shape. And so the question, and they don't necessarily give you the same result. They often give you similar results. And in fact, also in, in paper with Ben, we also uh, analyze the, the average shapes. Uh, and uh, you know, they all come out to be similar. Uh, they are generally different. Uh, there is also really beautiful work by uh, Julian Kapler at, uh, in England who uh, showed that in principle you can also, there's also a concept of so-called dominant transition path. So this is sort of the most probable path. And he showed that you can actually get it directly from the distribution. It's, it's a very, very interesting result. Um, and so that, that's a very interesting object because you can also, if you take the derivative of this, you can get the velocity, right? And so that's the coarse grain velocity I was talking about. Uh, this velocity is very interesting because for example, if you compare this velocity to the thermal velocity, the ratio of the two is gonna give you what people call the transmission coefficient, uh, which is the sort of the, you know that the transition phase theory is, is, is a very bad approximation for diffusive dynamics because you have a lot of recrossings. And so you can try to correct for that by using the transmission coefficient. So it turns out that this velocity tells you about transmission coefficient. Um, and turns out that there are some, uh, in my opinion, beautiful exact relationships between this velocity, for example, and the exact reactive flux from A to B. So yes, so this is, this is very interesting. Uh, these, are, these are all very interesting issues and uh, uh, we should be looking at all these. Thank you very much. Okay, so Dima, there are no further questions. So please allow me to ask the next 15 questions. But in sake of time, <laughs> I, I just uh, uh, asked my la the last question of the 15. Non-Markov is the rule and Markov is the exception. Um, if this is the case, Dima, why, why have Markov models been so enormously su successful the past, let's say, 30 years in studying proteins and protein dynamics? Is it just because we are only able to reach the high time resolutions or the very fast processes now? Or is it because we mainly measured mean first passage times in the past and uh, non-Markovian processes become more prominent when we look at, tran uh, at transition past times? So what, what is your explanation for that, for well, the success of Markov models? I think it, it just depends on what you're looking at, right? I mean, many proteins fold, uh, the small proteins, right? They fold uh, with a two-state kinetics, right? And so, of course, uh, that's the simplest Markov model. It's, it could be very accurate, right? So it's, it's, it's just fine. Uh, however, and so that's actually a very interesting um, sort of comment. So in chemistry, uh, sort of in the chemical dynamics, the first, I think the, the first people who, actually started worrying about non-Markov effects uh, where uh, you know, the famous paper by Grote Heinz, right? So they said that, so what happens if we have a non-Markov barrier cross and what happens to the rate? And, and so they, they point, uh, the argument that people make is that, well, clearly the memory time, whatever it is, is much shorter than the you know, the time, the first passage time, whatever, the dwell time, or the, the time it takes to make a transition, right? And so surely it's, all, it's always negligible. And they specifically point out in their paper, but no, this is, this is a wrong argument because you should not be comparing the time to the dwell time in your reactant state, or, the, or you shouldn't be comparing to the rate of your reaction. You should be comparing it to actually, well, they don't say that, but effectively you should be comparing it to the transition, uh, transition path time. And even though this time could be much shorter than the time that you Money. think is relevant, nevertheless, if you actually want to calculate the rate, your Markov approximation is gonna be complete garbage. 
So if you actually want to predict the rate of your transition, you, you, you say that, yeah, the, the, the Markov model, the two-state model is fine. But if you actually wanted to predict the rate of this transition, then you would find out that the Markov approximation does not work at all. So right. I think it just depends think, on what, you, what you're looking at. Yeah, I, I was also thinking about uh, disordered proteins and, uh, and polymer dynamics and uh, particularly their diffusive models or Markov uh, uh, or simple diffusion in the potential of mean force to, to analyze the experimental single molecule thread data looks like it's working just fine. And it's, it's a big, it's, it's a sort of mystery. A little bit to me. Well, again, uh, I think, yes. So I, I think that that's sort of a, because we know that if I look at the dynamics, for example, of the distance between two monomers and the polymer, it's very, 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 very non Markov, right? Right. right. But yet, uh, you know, when you analyze the data, it, it comes out to be reasonable, right? Um, my Speculation is that as long as you look at the longest relaxation time scale, it's probably okay. But 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 you're right. I think in a sense that it's a it's it's a little bit disappointing because uh, your analysis is not self consistent, right? So you you trying to analyze your signal by using the Markov model that gives you some signal, but then. Well, well, maybe maybe that's the topic for the fourth theorem. Yeah, but but it, but it seems to it seems to work. Yeah, well, no, it seems okay. to work. Good. Good. Okay, all right. There are no further questions. Thanks so much for for this beautiful talk and this uh, this really nice discussion, uh, Dima. Um, Thank and you guys. Thanks for joining. Um, it was great having you. And don't uh, don't forget, next webinar is uh, October fourth um, with uh, Peter Wright. Thank you all, and have a good uh, day and night. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Bye. Bye, Dima. Thanks a lot. We're talking tomorrow, right? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> bye bye. All right. Um, See you guys. Bye -bye. See you.